compatible finite element methods for numerical value prediction. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so this is, I've got lots of co-authors. So uh, I've got two postdocs, Gemma and Gemma Shipton and Hiro Yamazaki who've been working with me on some of the vertical slice stuff. David and Andrew and Lawrence, you, you all know, I think. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to start um, by working out how this slide thing works. Down button. There we go. Okay, so the question is, why do we need fancy element types? That's more or less what I'm going to explain in this, uh, this talk. And I'm going to uh, use a quote from Christian Jacobs, who's uh, an Imperial College PhD student, who said, well, he said Fidrake, actually, but um, uh, he's a postdoc, sorry, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, but you can say he's with Phoenix either. So he said, Fidrake is for the hipster elements. Okay, so, um, so that's, my, that's my image for the talk. And, okay, so the question is... Why, why are we using these fancy elements for atmosphere and ocean, ocean modeling? And there's a sort of supplementary question. So why are we using Fire Drake and PyP2 instead of Dolphin and UFC? And there's no particular strong reason apart from the fact that a lot of the features that we're using are currently available in Fire Drake. They, they could easily be implemented in Dolphin. Well, not easily, but they, they could be implemented in Dolphin UFC as well. But that's, that's why I'm currently over on that side. Also, the guy, the, you know, the principal investigator is two doors down from me down the corridor, so I can nag him <laughs> quite a bit. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so the, the main question is, you know, what, why is it so hard to build these kind of discretizations for numerical weather prediction? So, the kind of the experience, kind of going back uh, to John von Neumann and so on, is that if you take your favourite kind of numerical discretization that works well for fluid dynamics, and then you try to predict with the weather, for, weather with it, then it kind of becomes disastrous, you get complete nonsense within a few uh, time steps. And the reason for this is really to do with the kind of huge range of scales that you get in the atmosphere and the ocean, and the fact that the large scales, so this is a, this is a plot which I stole from Mike Cullen in the Met Office, you've got horizontal scales on this side here in t powers of 10 meters, and then time scales here, so everything above here is just dominated by diffusion, and then there's something called the Richardson line, where all of the weather features appear, so you kind of look at the weather map and all, all, everything you see is kind of clustered along this line here, and everything that you see here is the flow is sort of more or less almost completely horizontal and um, is almost exactly divergence free, and that's where kind of all, almost all of the activity is. But the equations support lots of other stuff as well, so in particular there are acoustic waves, like the ones I'm making now, um, that, that exist along this line here, and there are some other kind of waves uh, which Thomas showed you an example of, of the waves that move on the top of the ocean, uh, but there are also internal waves which are to do with the varying density in the atmosphere, and they exist on this line here. And the problem is that the model supports all of these very fast waves, but when you look out the window, what you see is something that's very slow and large-scale and balanced. So if you do get this wrong, then you'll end up starting here and then generating all this rubbish down here, and then within a few time steps all that you see is, 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 is existing down here. So that's the kind of the, the main problem that we have to deal with. Um, yeah, and so some other kind of issues which are all kind of related to this. So the main one is that we've never ever converged numerically in, in a weather forecast. We're nowhere near convergence. And that means that the grid scale stuff is really, really noisy. And furthermore, there's data assimilation going on and all kinds of physics parameterizations, and that generates noise at the grid scale as well. Um, and you, 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 the easiest thing to do with this noise would just be to filter it, but then you're really, if you try to do that, you find that you're just wasting loads of resolution and you're just getting a kind of mushy solution that doesn't look anything like the real weather. And yeah, so this line is just repeating what I said up here. So you've got this, we call it balance, this kind of slow, sort of nearly incompressible, nearly horizontal component. And so that's where all the, kind of all the dynamics is here. And we've got to make sure the model doesn't spuriously couple these bits and these bits, otherwise you kind of just get noisy rubbish. And it's also the case, um, uh, th this is the key issue, but a slightly secondary issue, which is also very important, is that conservation is very important because we're running the model over long time, time scales. So in a climate simulation, you might run the model for 500 or 1,000 years to get from spin up into uh, to actually making the prediction. If the mass has, if you've lost 50% of the mass in that time, then that's pretty embarrassing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain why... So, yes, yeah, so the whole point of my talk is to explain why we're using these fancy finite elements, and I'll explain it first by talking about the horizontal discretization. So Thomas 
talked about that a little bit. I'll just ex explain a bit more about what's going on. So here we're looking at this toy equation. So it's the linear rotating shallow water equation. So u is the horizontal velocity. So in the plane, we've just got um, uh, east-west and north-south velocity here. And we're considering a thin layer which has some height h. So it's just like the, the picture of the ocean that Thomas showed you, except in an infinite plane. And we've got, so these are, this is a, what the, the linearized equation, so it's a wave equation. We've got the time derivative of the velocity, time derivative of the height. There's a pressure gradient term, so that, that generates velocity from the pressure gradient. And then there's a mass flux term, so this is like a linearized continuity equation, so h naught is just the mean depth of the fluid. And there's also a term that's due to the rotation of the Earth, Coriolis term, Coriolis, and then F is a parameter, and then this U perp means that you rotate U by 90 degrees, so U V gets mapped to minus V U. Okay, so if we look at this, this solution, so if we cross this term off, then this just looks like the wave equation, and you've got these uh, wave, waves with speed square root G multiplied by H, and they are fast. But there are also steady solutions, so you can look for steady solutions, and those solutions are obviously divergence-free, and you've got this term balancing this term, that's called the geostrophic balance, and the, so these, these steady solutions are, by definition, slow. They're as slow as you can be, but when you throw the nonlinear terms back inside there, and curvature of the Earth, things like that, then these, slow, these steady solutions become the slowly evolving stuff that's actually the weather we're interested in. So we need to make sure at the linear level that this steady state solutions are exactly divergence free. Otherwise, we will spuriously be coupling to the fast stuff that exists, and that's what goes wrong. So that's the, that's the kind of test, that, the first test that you apply to horizontal discretization in, in the model. And so, yes, yeah, so the discretization must preserve this kind of separation in, 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 into scales. Uh, okay, so I think people in this audience are more familiar with H div and H curl elements than, more, than most audiences I talk to, so I'll probably skip through this pretty fast. But so the idea is that we are looking at um, this uh, set of finite element spaces which have this um, ex sort of uh, uh, discrete Durham complex property. So if you take a, a function, a scalar function, you can evaluate its skew gradient. So if you treat it as a stream function, you get a divergence-free velocity field. And similarly, if you take any, any velocity field, you can evaluate the divergence and get a function which is in L2. <coughs> and then the idea is that finite element spaces respect this kind of sequence. So you've got a continuous finite element space. You take a grad perp, and you get something which is in H div. And then anything that's in H div, you can take a divergence and get something that's in this, uh, this space here, V2. And so the... the so the property one is that the grad perp operator maps from here to here, and the property two is the divergence maps from here to here. And uh, the other property that you acquire is you have some projections which come down from here to here, and they don't really get used in the numerical methods that much, although I do use them for some things, and I won't talk about it today. But, the, uh, but they exist for the point of view of understanding the stability um, of, the, of all of the, the discretization. Okay, and so just quickly show some examples because I think people here are more familiar, th familiar than most. So the easiest one to explain is if you have P2 on triangles, it's quadratic, continuous. You take a skew gradient, you get something which is linear because I took a gradient, and it has continuous normal components, but the tangential components are not continuous, and that's called BDM1. And then if you take the divergence of one of these people, then you get a uh, P0 function for the L2 <laughs> space. So that's the simplest example. And I've got this figure that shows how these things glue together when you have se several elements together. So you've got full continuity here, just continuity of the normal component here, and then no continuity for V2. But I think most people in this room understand how th those things work. There's a few extra. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of the lowest order case. And then I like to show these other spaces because you can tinker around with the relationship between the number of degrees of freedom in the velocity and the pressure, it turns out to be important to try to get um, the dimension of the global dimension of this space being uh, twice the global dimension of this, this space. And you can achieve that in various different ways by using BDFM1 uh, on triangles or on quads uh, by using the RT spaces. And uh, I like to use the, the, the next order up, which is this one, because then you can build... Uh, DG advection schemes very easily without having to reconstruct any, um, any fluxes. Uh, so there, there, so there's, a, there's a huge kind of zoo of different things you can choose, and so you can sort of tinker around with the degree of freedom count to get what you want. 
So in particular, RT naught on, so the RT family on triangles turns out to be a bad idea because it's too much velocity and that results in something which uh, uh, doesn't work for ocean and atmosphere modeling. I can explain why, but that's a bit of a longer story. Okay, so let's go back to our example. So here's this discrete uh, wave equation that I talked about. And remember, we're interested in the steady state solutions of this. Okay, so if we take a finite element discretization, we want u to be in the h div space, h to be in the L2 space, and then you just hit each of these with the test function. And then the only extra thing I've done is I've integrated by parts here, so the gradient on the solution has become a divergence of um, a test function. So this is just the kind of classic mixed finite element um, kind of approach uh, with, with this extra term. And, and so for things to be well behaved, first thing we need is the subcondition, so that this is a good approximation of the gradient. That's just kind of classical from kind of the 70s onwards, uh, various kind of papers about that. There's another issue which I don't have time, much time to talk about, which is that there are inertial oscillations, which are uh, where you've got a flat free surface, so this term goes, and then the solution is divergence free, so everything goes here. And what you just have is a, the, um, the velocity just oscillates around and around at frequency f. And there should be only two, solution, two uh, solutions <laughs> to that equation. And if you do something seemingly silly, like, for example, p1 dg p2, then you have an infinite number of these uh, solutions, and that also kills your simulation as well. And so, um, so these actually relate to the harmonic functions. Um, so if you know... Uh, the kind of finite element exterior calculus, then it's an application of that, uh, which you can prove that the, uh, the, these kind of um, compatible finite element spaces have the correct number of harmonic functions, and therefore you don't get any spurious inertial modes. Okay, so the thing I'm going to talk about is this geostrophic balance condition. So we're looking for steady state solutions of this equation. So basically, we're looking for, di for every divergence free velocity field, there should exist an H such that this term can balance this, uh, this term here. So that's the that's the extra thing which we proved. And it's a very simple three-line proof, so I'm going to show it to you on the next slide. It's quite fun. So what you do is you just take the, your three finite element spaces which satisfy these conditions. And then the claim is if you have u divergence-free and not a harmonic function, so it's the skew gradient of something, then there exists an h in the L2 space such that u and h is a steady-state solution of these equations. And so therefore, you can represent all of these balanced um, balanced states exactly, which is what uh, the meteorologist requires to be able to do. So it, the cons it's a constructive proof, so all you do is you've got your u, and then so you can find a stream function psi, which is in the continuous space, such that grad perp psi is equal to u. And then, oh sorry, there's a, I've, I've changed the notation at some point, this should say h delta, uh, to, so the h delta is defined by solving this equation, so basically you just take f psi, project it into the L2 space, and then you divide by G, and that defines your H. So these are test functions from the L2 space. And then you just proceed by calculation. It's a three-liner. So if you go back to our uh, uh, equation on the previous slide, you'll find that the W with du dt is just equal to minus the Coriolis term minus the pressure gradient term. So I've just reorganized everything onto the right-hand side. Then in step two, I just substitute that U is equal to grab perp psi. And then when I take a perp, if you perp something twice, you you, um, you, the minus becomes a plus. And then in the final line, I integrate by parts, and this is an exact integration by parts because psi is completely continuous and w is in h div, so this is an exact identity. It's not a finite element approximation. And I'm assuming that I'm on the sphere or something where there are no boundaries for this proof. You can add the boundary conditions as well. And anyway, so that becomes a divergence here, and then we've got a divergence of w here, divergence of w here, and then since divergence of w is in v2, we can just set gamma equal to divergence of W in this equation, and then these two things cancel, and then we get zero. So that means that we've constructed a, um, a steady-state solution of, of, of the equations as required. So as far as I know, this is the only way to build a uh, discretization which has all of these three properties all, all together, which are the things that are um, required by the meteorologists. Okay, so I will... Um, What's my finish time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Great. So, uh, so, okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the vertical discretization. So Thomas also talked a little bit about this as well, so you've kind of prepared. So here's the full 3D discretization for an incompressible model with temperature. So you can see, so U is now a three-dimensional velocity, and then here we've got, a, this is the pressure, and theta is the uh, temperature, basically. And then this is a buoyancy term, so this is the force... So if your temperature 
if, if the fluid of your temperature, it, uh, if the temperature of your fluid is higher than its surroundings, then you get a force upwards, um, etc. And then, so the point is that um, if u is equal to zero, then you're in a state of hydrostatic balance, um, as, as defined by Archimedes. And so that, that means that uh, in the vertical, the pressure gradient must balance this, um, uh, this buoyancy uh, term here. And so, again, this is an exa So the flow is, in, in the large scale flow in the atmosphere, is always very, very close to being hydrostatic, even though it's moving. And, um, and it's very important that the discretization also supports these steady states as well. So how do we address that in the, uh, this, this framework? Uh, well, first of all, we build a vertical discretization. So we can take any 2D finite element discretization of the type that I just described. And then you also find a one-dimensional set of spaces. You've got a continuous um, one-dimensional space and a discontinuous one. And the derivative maps from one to the other. And then you can make uh, four... Uh, three-dimensional spaces, we've got, where, which are mapped together with a gradient and a curl and a divergence, which are built out of, whoops, um, going the wrong way. And these are built out of tensor products, so these formulas look a bit funny, but they are, um, uh, you, I can explain more about how they work, or you can see Andrew's paper, which is on the archive, uh, and it involves um, taking the various combinations of these, these spaces here. So you've got an H, a, a continuous space, an H-curl space, an H-div one, and this discontinuous space here. So we're making use of all of these spaces pretty much. And yeah, so for the density space, we take something DG in the horizontal with something DG in the vertical, and we make something that's completely DG. So Thomas already talked about this, so I can zoom through these to get to my point. You can build a horizontal velocity space by taking a horizontal uh, HDiv thing, tensoring it with a, a vertical DG thing, and then you get this space, which is a bit of a weird optical illusion, but it's actually arrows pointing out of the side walls. And... Um, the vertical part, you can take something that's DG in the a horizontal, tensor it with something that's CG in the vertical, and then you get a scalar field, and then you apply this HDiv operator, as defined in Andrew's paper, which then, so the scalar DOFs become the normal components of a vector uh, basis, uh, vector finite element space, which is the vertical part of the velocity space. Okay, so we've got to, uh, oh dear. Um, Okay, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> so we've got to decide where to put the temperature, and we want to pr preserve this uh, hydrostatic balance property that I mentioned. And so we just adopt the same idea that's currently used in finite difference methods. And that, in finite difference, people call this a Charney Phillips grid. And so what they do is they store the temperature at the same points as the vertical velocity. So the way we interpret that is that you just undo the H dip. So the temperature space is the same as the the vertical space before you applied this HDiv operator, so you get back to a scalar thing. So that was sort of intu an intuitive generalization. And the... Oh. Whoa. Like uh. Right, that's my slide. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, Yes, yeah, so I guess the excitement's rather gone out of this, and I've told you what the result is. The, the, uh, yeah, so, so this, is the, this is the hydrostatic pressure equation. It looks a bit funny because if we're just looking at the vertical component. But what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a test function that's from the vertical part of the velocity space only. So W always points in the up direction. So this becomes a divergence of a vector instead of a, a scalar thing. And then you can show that if you've got a columnar mesh, but it doesn't matter if you deform the mesh to go over a hill or, as Thomas did, have a resurface that's going up and down, or indeed, if you have uh, an ex extrusion of the sphere, then there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the temperature and the pressure up to a constant because you can um, shift the pressure up and down and this, this equation doesn't change. And then the mapping is then unique if there's a weak Dirichlet boundary condition for pressure on the top surface as you would have for the ocean. So this is... So these are the, this... Is, this, this this one-to-one -one mapping is what you require to avoid kind of spurious zigzag patterns appearing in the, in the solution very quickly. And the proof is just by the kind of the standard sort of um, Bretzy conditions on this mixed, uh, this mixed problem. Um, okay, so um, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I won't talk about this very much. But you can, given that you've got to have, you have to have this columnar brick structure in order to get the hydrostatic balance, you might as well exploit it in terms of the implementation. So 
Um, the, the kind of main challenge which I am working on now is that our choice of these finite element spaces has now been completely dictated to me by all of these kind of linear considerations, so this kind of balanced uh, kind of properties that I described, so geostrophic balance in the horizontal and hydrostatic balance in the vertical, uh, good representations of those balances. So now I have to develop numerical schemes for the, the full nonlinear equations in three dimensions under these constraints, and I don't have any leeway anymore. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting issues, so we've made, found a way to conserve various things, uh, ways to, put, to make the advection term the momentum equation, uh, how to advect temperature around in this weird... Uh, so you know, the thing I probably didn't emphasise is that the, um, the, this temperature space is discontinuous in the horizontal, but it's continuous in the vertical. So we have to, use, we have to kind of build a, an advection scheme that's stable and accurate for that. Um, and also, how do we get an efficient solver when we've got this uh, HDiv space for uh, the velocity field for the kind of linear system that arises. Um, so I think I'll just go, so, okay, so basically we have something for the temperature, you do a sort of DG in the horizontal, SUVG in the vertical, seems to work, I can show you some pictures in a second. Um, for, the, uh, for the linear system that you have to solve, so it's a semi-implicit formulation where you have to solve a sort of Helmholtz equation. This is a mixed Helmholtz equation with some parameters involving delta t, and in, in, in the UK Met, Met Office forecast model, for example, what they do is they eliminate u, and then they solve this discrete elliptic problem for p, and they reconstruct u, and that doesn't work in compatible finite element methods, is the mass matrix here is not diagonal. So what we um, can do is use this uh, trick of hybridization, which goes back uh, a long time as well, and you basically just replace the, uh, the hdiv space with a broken version of it, so it's like a, a DG element, sorry, an RT element in each, uh, uh, each element without the inter-element continuity. And then you enforce inter-element continuity with Lagrange multipliers that are integrated over the element edges. So I probably only have enough time to show this so the people who know what this means will, uh, will, will understand. And then what you do is you eliminate U and P, and then you get an equation just for the Lagrange multipliers. And so we're actually able to support this in Firedrake. So we've got things like broken elements and uh, trace elements, which we can use to uh, construct the, the U and the lambda. And we can also assemble the inverse of uh, DG matrices by passing inverse equals true. So David did a little hack uh, there to, to make that work. And then at the moment, it's a bit primitive. We just build this um, uh, Shaw complement matrix in Petsy. So we're just using the Petsy for pi interface here to actually build that matrix, which we then solve each time step. Um, okay, so I'll just finish by showing you a, a, a pretty movie. So this is a, a vertical slice. It's actually t you're just seeing half of it. And this is a bubble of cold air that, that sinks down and then becomes a gravity, gravity current as it goes along. So the main thing you can see, so this, this, this um, current is being advected by this mixed advection scheme, which is a combination of DG and SEPG. It's not bounded at the moment, so you will see a few oscillations. I'm working on that at the moment. But you can see it, it's stable and it didn't, uh, it didn't blow up, basically. Um, so I think I've gone a bit over time, so I'll stop there. Me or you, so it's okay. <laughs> Any questions? Yep. Um, so the um, the kind of the principle behind designing weather models is that the model should run without any viscosity at all. It should be completely stable. And then so the only, the only reason to introduce viscosity or diffusivity is if you want to parameterize uh, sort of turbulence or something like that. So in, so in global weather models, they have a sort of boundary layer scheme that's just a vertical diffusion and viscosity that's uh, some function of the, the local variables that's, uh, that's applied there. So in all, so in all of this... In, in, all, in the kind of the, what do you call it, the kind of the, the, 
the, the sort of dynamical core, then the boundary condition would just be u dot n equals zero, and there's a, it's, a, it's a slip boundary condition. But yeah, but then if you, if you put in one of these parameterizations, then you, you may or may not have a no-slip boundary condition, depending on what kind of, what kind of turbulence closure is being used there. But, the, but the, the, the goal is to come up with something that runs and is stable and accurate without the turbulence closure in, and then you can plug it, plug it in after the fact. Oh, no? Yes, um, so the only thing, extra thing that needs to be added uh, on top of the list I showed you is a, the discretization of the pressure gradient term, which is a, no, a nonlinear. So they have, instead of being grad p, it becomes theta grad pi. So, so theta is the temperature, and then pi is some funny function of the density and the temperature. So I have a discretization for that, which um, you can show reduces to their current discretization if you if you do it at the lowest order and lump the mass and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, well, it, it, uh, no, so, it, so it, yeah, so it's, it, it's, the same, it's the same story. It works exactly the same. Yeah. Any final questions? At some point, Marie had a hand up. Right? No. <laughs> I was just wondering about the, um, all the other... Uh, Yes, well, I'm being paid to do so, so. All the other physics, so the, what's it called? Physics. The physics. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so my, that's uh, it's essentially someone else's job, but we have to talk to physics people to understand what, what it is we need to be able to do. Okay. So at the moment, they do something rather crude anyway. So they have this kind of staggered grid discretization, uh, but then they map everything to the pressure points, which are the cell centers, in order to communicate with physics, and then physics creates fluxes, which are then mapped back again. So as a stupidest thing, you could just project everything to P0, give it to the physics people, and then map it back. But I'm sure that better things, better things can be done, but at least we can do what they currently do at the moment. And is this something that happens now at the end of time, or is there a Yes, but there's different times. So there's, there's, it's a nonlinear system. So there's a kind of an iterative uh, sort of several. Each time step has several iterations. But there's some physics which is called fast physics, which happens inside the iteration, and some other physics that's slow, which only happens as a correction at the end of the time step. So I can. I think radiation is fast physics. Can you uh, and the boundary layer. Uh, and yeah, so those are, those are the main things that you need to worry about incorporating into the into the solver. Everything else is sort of like. Um, the, the dynamics people I talk to treat those, the, the slow physics as these horrible people who come and put noise into your nice clean model at the end of each time step. <laughs> more, more or less. Yes. Oh, it's just because it's, um, so, yeah, so the question was, why, why am I hybridizing? And, and because the solution is, of the hybridized system is equivalent to the original system. So it's, it's in order to get a more efficient solver. So if you, tr if you just try to apply an iterative method to the, the, the big kind of mixed system, then uh, the kind of standard smoothers like SOR or ILU or whatever, whatever don't work very well for the velocity part. But well, they do work very well for the hybridized part, so you can get a, a good multi-grid algorithm at that, at that level. Thanks, well, that's, uh, thank you. Was it the Acrobat reader that was, was yeah. opening? Um, and, uh,